Hello everyone. Welcome to this session on data engineering with AWS. I'm Suman Devnath, a principal developer advocate here at AWS, and uh, I'm based out of India. And I, I'm super excited to share a few of the uh, practices that we do uh, for data engineering. And uh, I'm going to share a few of my experience when I got started with a few of the services which are along, uh, along the line with data engineering. So, I'm very sure that uh, you are enjoying the learning uh, uh, process at the Reskill platform. And uh, in the upcoming days, I'm very sure that uh, you would be able to leverage this platform to not only learn, but also contribute to the community. So before I get started with this, I just want to uh, you know, give a big shout out for the whole team who have built this platform, um, uh, both within AWS as well as uh, from the community, uh, because this is mostly done by the community. So a big shout out for them. And uh, I got a lot of feedback in last uh, one month. And uh, I'm very sure that uh, we will go, uh, you know, uh, we will progress from this, this point onwards uh, every passing month. Okay. So uh, with that, uh, let's uh, get started uh, with uh, today's session. So uh, before we uh, get into the uh, nitty gritty of different services, uh, I want to make sure that this session is uh, mostly hands-on and uh, we will not spend much time on PPT and uh, it might uh, split into two different parts. Uh, maybe there will be, this would be a first part and there will be a following part uh, after this. Uh, so we'll see uh, how it goes. But the idea is, uh, you know, once you go over the session, uh, you know, I would really encourage you to go uh, and open the console and play around all of these and uh, come back to me or anyone you are, uh, you know, you work with, uh, you know, feel free to share your learning so that, you know, uh, we both can learn over the process. Okay, so with that, uh, let's get started. So uh, when we talk about data, uh, you know, we have seen that, uh, you know, data has been exploding in the last couple of uh, years. In fact, uh, you know, the statistics says that 90% of the data that we have in this entire planet was generated in the last two years. So just imagine what would happen in uh, next couple of years from now. So data has been increasing and there was, uh, there were, uh, there are very significant reasons for that. So if you look back, uh, you know, in 2007 or 2008, at that time I was in college, uh, you know, there was hardly anything. Although that was uh, quite an early age and uh, people started to use cloud and other things. And it was not that, uh, you know, old. I mean, uh, that time, it's roughly around 13 years back, but still uh, not everyone used to carry mobile phones, right? So, but now if you look at it, you know, everyone has, uh, you know, more than one phone, tablets, and, uh, you know, computers, it's, it, it, we take it for granted that everyone <laughs> is having a computer or a laptop. So there is an enormous amount of information around us. And uh, most of them are, you know, we just take it for granted, right? Like, but if you just go back and think about it, it was uh, quite unimaginable, right? The way that uh, we, we do things today, right? Uh, just uh, take an example, uh, you know, how we order food. Uh, you know, have you ever thought that you could even order food 10 or 15 years back? Yeah, right with from your uh, using your smartphone um, like I, i'm from calcutta so there was a uh, it, it was quite hard to even get a cab yeah, you know 15 years back but now it's just like with uh, you know you, you can just use your phone to book your cab right so data is everywhere now there are a lot of uh, uh, you know a uh, lot of different services or different companies have come up because of this data right so uh, if we use uh, netflix uh, then we use linkedin youtube uh, you know daily in on daily basis we use uh, youtube right so there are lots of lots of services which uh, you know our companies have built uh, based on data if you look at it at the nutshell it's all uh, data now if you are from a data engineering background or data analyst or even a machine learning engineer, uh, you know, you would know that, you know, data is the core of everything. Uh, like, uh, you know, I've been focusing a lot on machine learning and uh, you know, if you are into machine learning, you would know that almost 70 to 80% of the time you spend, uh, you know, spend on cleaning the data that you get from different sources, right? So you should have a right mechanism uh, uh, so that you can, you can clean your data, you can, uh, you know, process your data and uh, you can, so that you can make best use of the machine learning models that you are going to build, right? Or you're going to train. Now, at the same time, it is very, very important that how you consume those data. I mean, uh, when I say consume your data, I mean, uh, uh, you know, mostly uh, in real time, 
right? So uh, consider a situation like uh, uh, a police station uh, getting the data uh, from all the sensors, all these CCTV cameras uh, from a city, right? How they consume it, and in case of any uh, any any issue in any of the place, uh, any fraud or any um, uh, any uh, any any uh, obnoxious task, right? Like let's say a murder or let's say a theft. You know, to get into the root cause, they should be able to get hold of the right data instantaneously. They cannot just wait for 10, uh, you know, 10, 15 days to process the data and get the right information. That hey, in that particular uh, street, uh, who was there at that particular time, right? So they need to have that data as and when it is needed. Now, when we talk about data, there are different types of data. Right? Uh, they have structured data, semi-structured data, and unstructured data. This is a, these are kind of a broad classification which covers everything. So as the name suggests, uh, structured data uh, is nothing but the relational databases or relational data that we are aware of, like RDBMS or uh, from the product side, maybe you can think about uh, MySQL or Oracle or RDS in Amazon or Aurora. So these are uh, kind of structured data where you have the data in row column format and you can query it using sql uh, or and it, it's basically you don't have to do anything like so data is exactly the way um, that you have defined right so you you define the schema first and then you put the data in whereas uh, we have something called unstructured data uh, which is kind of all the data all, all different kinds of data which are not structured uh, can come into this category like documents or media files pdfs etc Right, and this is the data which most of the people these days are, uh, you know, working with. Now, if I if I give you a perspective or if I give you an intuition of uh, how important unstructured data is, which you might have uh, taken it for granted, uh, but just imagine that when you open a bank account today. Uh, right, uh, you can open a bank account from your home, right, with your smartphone. There are banks there, like Neo Bank. If you uh, if you want to explore, you can check that. Uh, you know how a Neo Bank works, uh, but uh, if you see, uh, what they do is when you try to open an account is you will just fill up an online form, right? So all when you feed everything in the online form, it's kind of a structured data, right? You can imagine that there is a database in the back end uh, where your data is, uh, you know, getting feeded, where, the, uh, you know, uh, the columns might be name, address, age, uh, you know, qualification, profession, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. At the same time, uh, you know, in the same form, what you do is you upload your images. Right. So that means that, uh, you know, uh, you upload your photograph and then uh, you upload your fingerprints or uh, or maybe, you know, you do an uh, other uh, 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 verification. Right. Other, I mean, other card is very much specific to India, but uh, you get the idea. Right. So when you when you look at your form, which you use to open an account, it contains different types of data, not only structured data. It also, uh, you know, it also uh, had uh, media files, uh, which is your photograph or fingerprints. And also it might be some documents like, let's say, your address proof, uh, maybe uh, your passport or your other copy or whatever. Right. So these all things go together in some place now imagine that if you put the data in different different silos in different different uh, places uh, how difficult it would be for the application to read from different sources right so there should be some better mechanism or uh, this process should be uh, you know taken care uh, you know in your data analysis or data processing pipeline right so that is about unstructured data and then we have uh, semi structured data so these data are uh, typically uh, a json file or xml file and these are uh, these we use day in day out right so these are the three broad categories of data that we have now we, when you look at uh, aws uh, uh, and this is not specific to aws but uh, when you look at uh, the data the ultimate objective uh, for any data analyst or data uh, engineer is to make sure that their data is there in a centralized repository so that uh, you know you don't have to um, go at different places uh, to consume that right so uh, so this is what the data lake definition is so you can uh, you know search it uh, and you can find a, a more refined definition but in a nutshell a data lake is a centralized repository that allows you to store all the structured and unstructured data at scale right so what that mean uh, that means that uh, you put all the data uh, you know in in your data lake and 
in AWS, uh, you know, that, that would be typically an S3 uh, bucket or uh, S3. And uh, you put all the data there. And then over the period of time, uh, you know, you can make use of data uh, by integrating it with different services and make the best use of it. Maybe you want to, uh, you know, push the data to uh, a data warehouse to Redshift, or you might, do, uh, you might have want to do some analysis using some uh, SQL query on the data. So, so idea is their business, uh, different business unit would need uh, different tasks uh, to be done. Uh, they need to, uh, they, they need to have different tasks on the same set of data. So uh, when you have a data lake, you you, you reduce uh, the duplication of the data at different places right so so when you look at uh, data lake that's that's the core thing that all data are in one place and that is the single uh, source of truth right so and you you can just uh, make use of the same data and you can use it in different formats for different applications and different services right? and why you need that uh, because a uh, data lake or even uh, s3 it it supports a very high a fast ingestion right so you can put as much data as possible and uh, as much data as you need and uh, uh, you know you can consume it at the same pace right so you don't have to worry about scale and that is the most important thing when you think about cloud in general uh, right for uh, while you're designing your application now the uh, third important thing is uh, schema on read so this is very very important uh, the schema on read because this is something which is completely different than uh, you know uh, other uh, data uh, databases uh, like let's say uh, you consider any structured database like let's say uh, uh, let's say SQL uh, or Oracle, right? So there, uh, what you do is you first define the schema and then you put the data in, right? So you, you, your your data should be adhering to that schema. Uh, whereas uh, uh, in 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 data lake, it's kind of the other way around, where you put the data first and you can put any type of data, and it's kind of the schema is read from the data, right? So and we are going to see that what it means uh, in the demo section. But uh, the idea is, uh, you know, you can you, you can do query on those data, and it's kind of uh, you know what you you can resonate it with the uh, no SQL data where you don't have schema as such, and uh, you can put your data and your every item uh, of your table can have different uh, attributes, and uh, the schema is read from there. Right, so uh, I will get into that uh, you know in the demo section. Okay, so. And the the other important thing is uh, it's a, it's low cost, right? Because uh, you are reducing uh, the data du uh, deduplication or uh, data duplication across different sources, and uh, it also decouples uh, your storage uh, from your compute resources. So imagine uh, you know you have uh, your st uh, data here, right? So sorry, let me select the back. Yeah, you have your storage here, right? And uh, this is let's say this is s3 and then you have some application here and this uh, this application might be running in ec2 instance uh, there might be another application which might be running a lambda function right and all this application are actually consuming the same data so so if you look at it you know uh, you are actually decoupling the compute resources uh, with respect to the storage resources right so that is good because you don't have any dependencies so tomorrow if you want to have uh, another application which might need some other uh, ser uh, service let's say a redshift right uh, you can always use the same data uh, you know to uh, for your data warehouse uh, activity or data analysis right so that's the beauty of uh, decoupling the storage from the compute and uh, obviously, last but not the least, and that's the most important thing, uh, you know, you get all the protection and security in one place. So, so you don't have to uh, roam around for uh, security uh, concerns uh, for not only internal, uh, but also uh, from your external users. Now, when you look at the uh, whole data pipeline, uh, you know, these are the uh, 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 four different categories or different stages that uh, it would go through, right? So it will have a data source uh, from where the data will come in. And then th you should have some ingestion where you will consume that data. And then you have to store that data somewhere, right? And then you will analyze the data. And then again, you will consume. So this consumption might be uh, from different services. And we are going to see that, uh, you know, uh, one by one. Uh, what we mean by all these different stages. 
so let's start with the uh, data stores or uh, the first uh, stage that is uh, you know from where the data is coming right so data sources can be uh, uh, can be different right uh, it can be uh, some of the service within aws or it can be uh, something uh, from outside so for example it can be connected device as we were just discussing about uh, how you can how the data can come from various uh, IoT devices, right? Or uh, it can be uh, a web log, uh, right? Or it can be an ERP data uh, that is sitting uh, for in your application. Or it can be even an EC2 instance, uh, and uh, your data source might be logs. So you might want to, you know, analyze all the logs of all the compute uh, systems that you have, all the EC2 systems that you have. So in that case, uh, all the logs would be your data source. So uh, in uh, in all of these, you know, we cannot get into details of all, all of these uh, features and services, uh, but. DynamoDB is one of the most important things, so I just thought to spend some time on DynamoDB and then we will get into a small demo uh, with DynamoDB. So what is DynamoDB? So DynamoDB is a fully managed uh, multi-region, multi-master uh, database uh, where uh, you can store your data and it can scale uh, and it can also give you a single digit uh, a single digit millisecond latency and it's not traditional database so it's it's a low SQL database so you don't have to define your schema uh, uh, first place so uh, you know you can you can just uh, use DynamoDB if uh, if your real concern is the scale and performance uh, because what happens in DynamoDB is the way that it is uh, it stores the data in the backend or uh, storage is uh, you get a consistent performance over the period of time right no matter uh, you are using your database um, you know uh, uh, size is let's say uh, uh, 1 GB or uh, you know uh, 1 TB your performance is quite uniform across uh, the different uh, sizes so as your data database uh, grows. So before we jump into DynamoDB, these are the few uh, fundamentals um, uh, when we think about SQL and NoSQL. Right? So uh, like uh, SQL is very much uh, uh, you know, normalized and uh, NoSQL is kind of, uh, you know, we denormalize that. So it's, it, it has a schema and whereas NoSQL doesn't have schema. So it's not a very, uh, uh, you know, it's not correct to say it doesn't have schema. Uh, it does have schema, but it's just like your application should be aware of that, right? So your application should uh, should handle that schema thing, but uh, not uh, on the database side. So DynamoDB can take uh, whatever data you throw at him, right? But uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, DynamoDB is not your end application, right? So your application must be somewhere on the top of the stack. So in that case, that application should be aware uh, of the schema and it, it can take care of that. But database, uh, you know, it, in DynamoDB, it can just uh, take the data as it comes. So it's not very good for uh, complex uh, uh, queries it, uh, uh, because there is, uh, uh, you know, we typically do not uh, uh, suggest to use, uh, you know, uh, queries that you do uh, when you join uh, two tables in a re uh, relational database uh, systems, but but yeah, these are the trade-offs that you have. Uh, but you, we, we need to think whether you actually need, need that or not uh, in your application, right? So if you need that, then surely you should go with uh, any of the uh, structured database like uh, RDS or Aurora, which is uh, uh, which is quite amazing. So it's kind of a serverless offering of a relational database. Okay, so another thing is, uh, you know, when you think about SQL to NoSQL, um, you know, SQL databases are typically, they, they scale uh, vertically, right? So, uh, you know, if you just think about from on-premise uh, standpoint, you take a server, you uh, install some, uh, you know, uh, relational database, and let's say uh, you get over, uh, your consumption is quite high and you need to scale. So you need to buy another server and stack it over and, you know, scale vertically. Whereas in those SQL database, uh, you scale horizontally. So uh, as and when a more workload comes, it can just uh, scale dynamically. Having said, uh, said uh, you know, all of this, uh, these days it's very difficult to uh, segregate, uh, you know, uh, no SQL and SQL. Uh, so there are multiple factors involved. So uh, you may argue, you know, uh, uh, we can scale, uh, you know, horizontally as well uh, when we think about Aurora, right? So, uh, so but this is uh, at a very generic uh, uh, fashion or generic way to uh, distinguish between SQL and no SQL. Now, when we talk about uh, NoSQL, there are different engines uh, available, right? So there is a key value store, uh, which you see uh, here. Uh, 
let me use the pen one second yeah if you see the key value pair uh, so this is the one uh, where you have uh, some uh, key and then you have different uh, attributes right so this is very much uh, predominant when you think about any inventory store or a shopping cart right where you have the product id and the different i you know attributes of that product right uh, with the size color etc and then uh, we have columnar data this is typically used in uh, in a data warehouse and analytics and uh, these are this is used in uh, 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 redshift as well where you store the data in columns so you, you, you all your different attributes like in this case uh, date city order number they are stored in in a columnar uh, fashion so if you want to uh, search uh, for items uh, let's say if you want to search for items which are of city uh, kolkata right so it will just uh, you know search in this particular column it doesn't have to search uh, you know row wise right it doesn't have to do that so you 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 get a better performance and you can uh, complete the query in quick time right so when you have when you store data in a columnar uh, fashion again this have a different use case but uh, this is one of the uh, no sql engine type and then you have a document oriented data where you have this data in a in a document format where uh, you store the data uh, in kind of a json and uh, this is very much uh, common when you think about uh, uh, dynamo db and we are going to see that how you how your data would look like uh, when uh, when you put that uh, into dynamo db okay so it's kind of a a, a json uh, document where you see that all these uh, all these keys are actually different fields right and this is let's say the first item right this this is the first item so the next item uh, would come uh, after this so it, so the next item may not have name right may not have name whereas the uh, first item had this name right so uh, and we will see that uh, what are the prerequisites to have a, uh, a dynamo db uh, a table but uh, the idea is it's quite dynamic you don't have any schema so you can put the data uh, as it comes or uh, you know depending on uh, the uh, the item and then uh, lastly we also have a, a graph uh, type of database or a graph type, a graph type of uh, data engine uh, where uh, all your tables are connected uh, through a graph structure so uh, so you know you don't have to do all those complex uh, uh, join uh, you know uh, from your side right and these are very much used in uh, engine recommendation or uh, fraud detection right so uh, so these are the uh, these are the graphs uh, or these are the database engine which are used in uh, recommendation engine and uh, as well as uh, for fraud detection okay so now let's see that uh, how uh, how uh, a typical database uh, with lambda work right so let's say uh, this is a practical uh, scenario and uh, you would be able to appreciate more about dynamo db when you think about your application in the form of lambda function so let's say you have a lambda function and uh, it is uh, getting triggered and uh, due to some incoming traffic and uh, that lambda function uh, is supposed to write some data in the database and now the database is let's say 20 percent used now more incoming data or more traffic is coming and the usage of the database increases to 50 percent now there is a point when the database is uh, has reached the threshold right it's uh, it reached uh, 70 percent of usage so what to do now so in a typical uh, a, a, you know fixed uh, read write limit when you have this uh, uh, you know read write uh, capacity as fixed uh, or rather you can think about it as as your uh, database engine right this whole instance uh, is reached in terms of capacity, uh, your database uh, might respond slow or even your application might crash, right? Because uh, here, this is very much scalable, right? So it can scale uh, up and down, right? So because your Lambda uh, it, it can be uh, scaled according to your incoming traffic. But what is happening is this is this, uh, your, in the back end, your storage is not at all scalable right so your database is not scalable so you are trying to uh, build an application where you in the middle you have something scalable but in the back end you don't have something which is scalable so that creates a lot of problem 
Now let's look at uh, how uh, a lambda function will work uh, with a database with which is having a scalable retrait limit. Uh, so in this context, uh, you know, we are talking about a DynamoDB. Now, workload keeps on coming. Uh, it uh, keeps on uh, increasing, uh, you know, the read-write capacity of, of, uh, of the database increases. And when it reaches uh, the threshold, the it has the auto scaling capacity and uh, it can just uh, scale the capacity right so it will just uh, scale the database in the back end right and once it is, uh, it is done uh, you know your database usage would again come down to let's say 20 percent right so uh, that's that's how uh, you can scale in in the lambda layer and you can scale in the uh, database layer as well so that's uh, that's one of the advantage of how why you should use a database like uh, DynamoDB along with uh, serverless when you are building or thinking of some application uh, where scale is the most important thing so this is just to uh, summing it up. It's uh, DynamoDB is a fully managed uh, NoSQL database engine. It can store and retrieve uh, any amount of data, and uh, it's auto scalable. So you can, uh, you know, uh, you can auto scale. You can enable auto scale, uh, or you can uh, go with on demand, right? Which will increase the capacity will increase uh, with respect to your workload. And it's highly uh, available. That means that your data will be replicated across uh, multiple AZs. So if you, if you are uh, let's say if, if if you are creating a DynamoDB uh, uh, table in Mumbai region, it would be replicated across multiple AZs, uh, uh, you know, within Mumbai region. And in fact, it also supports a, a, a global table. Uh, we are not going to discuss that, but uh, in case you want to, your business uh, demands that uh, you need to uh, have an application where. The application is used uh, by your customers in uh, Asia Pacific or APAC as well as in US. In that case, you might use a global table uh, where uh, the replication between, let's say, Mumbai region and Northern Virginia will happen uh, from DynamoDB side itself. Right? So that's something a little advanced, but uh, you know, for the sake of it, you can uh, you can just skip that for now. But uh, if you're interested to know how a global table works in DynamoDB, uh, you may like to just uh, read the documentation. And uh, last but not the least, it's uh, uh, it's encrypted, so it's encrypted at the rest, so you don't have to worry about data security. Now there are a few fundamental uh, concepts that uh, one need to know now for DynamoDB. It's quite if you are from database background or if you have worked with any uh, relational database, um, you know this would be quite similar uh, uh, with just a slight change, like. First thing, so you don't have to create a uh, database, right? so uh, it's already there, and you just have to uh, create the table, right? So, uh, so this table is very much similar to uh, a traditional uh, table that you try to create uh, uh, in a, re a relational database, but uh, you know the concept is exactly the same. It's just a table, which is nothing but a collection of data, but Inside that table, uh, when you think about relational database, you put data in every row, right? So here, uh, we call it as items. So each table contains a zero or more items, and the item is nothing but a group of attributes. So this is very important. The item is, uh, you know, nothing but a, a group of attributes, right? And uh, we should we have to make sure that uh, you know if there, there should be some uniqueness a uniqueness across all the items in the table right and uh, we are going to see that uh, you know how we can do so and then we have attributes um, so in this example if you see uh, this is the item number one this is item number two and this is item number three right in this three uh, 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 items if you see there is one attribute which is common and that is uh, a person ID Right, and there are other attributes uh, which are there in different items, but they all are different. So here you have first name, last name, and phone number, but uh, here uh, you don't have phone number. Phone number is missing, right? Whereas it has address. So address is missing here. So you see that uh, you know the, the schema is not defined, right? So there are different types of uh, different attributes are there in different uh, items. Now, how we can uh, uniquely identify an item uh, in, a, in, a, in a table, and that is uh, using something called primary key. Okay, and in this example, the primary key is actually the people ID, as you might have guessed, 
because that is present in all the items. So when you create a DynamoDB table, you have to define uh, a primary key, and that uh, that only defines the uniqueness of the item inside that table. Now, what is that primary key? So as I mentioned, you create that uh, when you create that table, but there are two different types of, uh, you know, a primary key. One is uh, the partition key, okay, which is a simple primary key. And uh, there is another one called uh, primary key and sort key. So yeah, it, uh, you know, it might be a little complex, uh, you know, first place, but when I show you the example, uh, you know, this will get a little more clear. So the idea is uh, in the previous example, uh, we, did, we didn't have any sort key. We just, we, we just had uh, one primary key and that is person ID. Okay, so now let's say that you have a table where, uh, you know, you, you feel that only a person ID is not unique. Uh, maybe person ID and uh, let's say last name is unique. Okay, so last name is not a very uh, good example. So let's say person ID and date is unique. So in that case, uh, you know, the person ID will become a primary key and, uh, you know, uh, and uh, or partition key and the date will become a sort key. Okay, so basically two keys together uh, makes a primary key and that defines a uniqueness of an item in that particular table. Okay, so I'm going to show you one example next and then it will get a little more clear. And uh, there are some fancy terms that uh, you might see. Uh, so we call it as a hash attribute. So whenever you see hash attributes, you can think about uh, you know partition key. Uh, and uh, whenever you think about uh, you know hear about uh, uh, range, you can think about uh, it's nothing but the sort key, right? So this is just a term that we use internally. Now this is how uh, the whole things look like. So you can think of it as uh, let's say this is item number one, item number two three, four, and five, okay? And this is my whole table. And in this in this uh, table, we have one primary key and one sort key, uh, sorry, one partition key and one sort key. And if we combine this with this uh, sort key, uh, we get the primary key, okay? So now these two define the uniqueness of an item. Okay, so it might happen that, uh, you know, the primary key is, uh, let's say that is, uh, um, let's say that is name. So I can have someone here. Okay, I can have someone. Okay, but uh, the sort key uh, should be uh, different, right? So let's say, uh, uh, maybe my city. Okay, so let's say Bangalore. And this, let's say Kolkata. Right. So now uh, these two items were, uh, can be uh, identified uh, separately because when you combine these two, we get a uniqueness of the, uh, you know, uh, of an item in this table. Right. So, uh, uh, so the way to think about it is uh, all you need to do is you either go with only partition key. Okay. Or uh, you can have a sort key and a partition key, which defines the primary key. Okay, that's the uh, whole idea. It's all about how you can define a uniqueness uh, in your table. Now, there, there is something internal that uh, why uh, you might think that why DynamoDB is so fast and uh, how how it can, uh, you know, uh, have such a persistent uh, performance. So before I explain this, uh, you know, hash thing, uh, as I was telling, right, if you, if you take a graph like this and, and uh, uh, you, this is your capacity, right? And this is, let's say, um, um, your performance, right? So you will see that if you uh, go with, uh, you know, any uh, any uh, SQL based or any traditional database, uh, as and more your performance, uh, you know, uh, your capacity increases, right? The, your performance will go down, right? So it, it, I mean, this is typically, uh, you know, the case. So you have to your performance get a very bad hit. Uh, when you when it scales, whereas in DynamoDB, uh, you know that that remains persistent. So it's always persistent, no matter how much data that you have. All right. So the way that uh, the, the one of the reason is why uh, you know performance is so uh, so amazing in DynamoDB is uh, because of something called a hash function. So what happens is, uh, uh, let's say you have this uh, DynamoDB okay, table. Okay, and uh, you are putting the data here, right? So through some API. Okay, so you are putting some uh, API request, and the data is coming to DynamoDB uh, uh, table. Uh, what happens is uh, it uses uh, it it 
gets that partition uh, key. So as we have just discussed, it will take that partition key. Okay, this is the partition key, and it will have a hash function. Okay, and this hash function will define where in the backend the data should go. Okay, so there might be different storage uh, units in the backend, right? And uh, it will just uh, distribute the data in the right uh, uh, storage node uh, in the backend. So what happens is when you use this hash function, when it tries to read that uh, uh, data back, uh, you know, it's just an order of one, right? So uh, it's just how a, a typical hash works, uh, right, in, uh, in, in computer science. So uh, all the items uh, uh, with the same uh, partition uh, key value will be stored together, right? So uh, if, if, if you have the same partition key value, then it will be stored in the same uh, node, right? Or same uh, uh, partition. And, uh, you know, and the data is distributed uniformly. So you get a better performance uh, because, uh, you know, you are using a hash function and, uh, you know, it's always an order of one. Okay, so th that's about uh, the uh, partition uh, key. Uh, so the output uh, from the partition uh, hash function determines the partition, and the, the, that partition is nothing but the you know the physical location uh, of uh, physical location of the storage uh, where the data is. Okay, so that's about uh, the internal hash functions. Now this is the example that uh, you know, I was talking about where uh, this this one is having only uh, partition key and here this one is having only partition key and this one is having partition key plus uh, sort key so if you can see uh, here the uniqueness is uh, person id right which we have seen earlier but here if you see uh, the unique uh, this are this is not unique if you look at uh, the artist right this is uh, not unique but uh, if you consider artist and song title that combo or that couple is actually unique, right? So that, that's the whole idea about uh, the uh, partition key and the sort key, okay? So uh, let's jump into a demo and uh, we are going to see how you can make use of DynamoDB through uh, Boto3, which is a Python X SDK, but you can use any other SDK of the language of your choice, right? And we'll see a few of the operations of uh, DynamoDB, like how to create, how to load data, how to read data, and uh, things around that, okay? So let me open the console. Now that we have learned a little bit about uh, DynamoDB, uh, I just thought to uh, show you the documentation of DynamoDB so that uh, you know you can refer back and uh, you know explore the other features and functionalities and nuts and bolts about DynamoDB before you uh, get into the demo because DynamoDB is quite a deep topic and it's not possible to cover that uh, in 10 15 minutes of time frame right but you should be you should you should know where to uh, refer to uh, when you want to uh, get into uh, you know some deep dive so this is the developer guide uh, for Amazon DynamoDB. As it says, uh, you know, it is a fully managed SQL database service that provides fast and predictable performance with seamless scale. So uh, the scalability and predictable performance is the key uh, for DynamoDB. So whenever you are architecting some application which demands uh, a very high performance over the period of time and uh, you, you, you cannot compromise with your performance even when your application scales, DynamoDB is the thing that uh, you should consider. Now there are different uh, core concepts which we have already discussed. This is just a uh, you know uh, you know revision of what we have just discussed so far. Uh, the key table attributes, uh, primary key, and uh, things around that. So this is the same image which we have referred to in the presentation, right? Uh, so two things that we want to focus on uh, is one is the read consistency and the read write capacity mode. So uh, these are the two uh, which is unique to DynamoDB. So uh, uh, you know, I think that we should learn about this before we get into create table and uh, we jump into the demo, right? So uh, what is read consistency? So as we discussed that uh, DynamoDB uh, is, uh, uh, you know, is a service which, uh, which you can have in a particular region, right? And uh, uh, the data gets replicated across multiple AZs. But what happens is uh, when your application write data to DynamoDB table, it just receives a uh, you know a HTTP 200 response, and uh, the write has occurred, and you know uh, uh, from back end you get the acknowledgement. But uh, the data is eventually consistent across all the different AZs, 
okay so it's not like uh, when you write the data uh, in your dynamic db table uh, you know at the same time uh, you know all those uh, you know all the uh, the data is uh, destaged in all those three three or uh, you know four availability zone whatever it is in in that particular uh, region okay so th it might take uh, less than a second or so uh, to write the data across all the az so there might be a possibility uh, that uh, you know if you try to read the data immediately after write uh, you might get an older version of that data right so that's why that's what uh, eventual consistency uh, mean or eventually consistent read means so it says that uh, when you read the data from dynamo db table the response might not reflect the result of recently completed write operation the response might uh, includes some stale data if you repeat your read request after a short period uh, or short time the response uh, should return the latest data so this is something that uh, you need to take care and what is strongly consistent read uh, as the name suggests is exactly opposite of uh, uh, you know eventually consistent read uh, where you all it, it was always guaranteed that uh, you know you will be getting the up to date data so you might think you know why uh, why people uh, should use uh, eventual consistent read when you already have strongly consistent read right but uh, you know you can always uh, do so if your application demands that level of consistency but there are some disadvantages and there is a trade off that you need to think of so uh, first is uh, you know if, if you always use uh, or if you use strongly consistent read um, you know it it might uh, add some latency because it, it, it is uh, just a uh, you know simple physics right so because you want uh, up to date data uh, at every time you write something uh, that means that all your data uh, in all the availability zone uh, should be consistent right so it might take a little bit of more time uh, to write Write the data across all the AZs in that region. So this will add latency to your application. So you need to take care of that. And uh, uh, also, uh, you know, strong consistent read uh, uses more throughput capacity and uh, then eventual consistency read. So this is something that we are going to discuss next in the read write capacity mode. Okay. So just keep this in mind that uh, for read, uh, there is something called uh, eventual consistent read and strongly consistent read. Now, why this uh, why this is important? The reason this is important is uh, the way uh, you know DynamoDB is charged. The way that you will be paying for uh, DynamoDB is based on this. Okay, it's not based on, on the uh, gigabyte or terabyte of storage that you are using. Okay, so it's based on the read write capacity mode. So if you see here, the uh, you know the, this is uh, uh, this is the the uh, there are two types of uh, payment or you can say the capacity mode there are two uh, read write capacity mode um, and uh, and it is on demand and provisioned okay so we are going to see what these are but uh, uh, let's let's look into this uh, you know what is an on demand and what is a provision mode okay so as the name suggests the uh, on demand is uh, very flexible that means that you don't have to allocate uh, read capacity unit and write capacity unit so i guess this is the first time i am uh, taking these terms read capacity unit and write capacity unit and uh, i'm going to share what it is uh, uh, you know in a second but uh, when you select on demand it will be based on uh, you know your workload so more uh, uh, you know uh, request read request or write request is coming uh, you know dynamo db will automatically uh, scale Okay, but uh, th this this would cost you more, uh, uh, and also uh, this is needed when when you cannot predict your environment, right? When you cannot predict your application. So let's say you are uh, you know you're working on an application today, and this is the first time it is going to get deployed. Uh, you you may not have an idea of how much read capacity unit or how much write capacity unit you would need right or rather in simple terms how much uh, read request you will get from the user or how much write request you will get from the user is not yet known right so it, it may be a good idea to start off with on demand and over the period of time let's say six months seven months or even one month uh, you get an idea of uh, you know how how much workload that you are getting and based on that you can switch over to provision mode which is cheap and uh, it, you know that that will also give you uh, uh, and uh, uh, a way to predict uh, your workload okay so that's about uh, uh, on demand mode and uh, what is provisioned uh, mode a provision mode is when you define the read capacity unit or read request unit and a uh, write request unit okay so now what is read request unit and a write request unit 
So the way that is uh, defined is uh, one read request unit represents one strongly consistent read request or two eventually consistent uh, read request. Okay, and that's why uh, we we learned about what is consistent read request and eventual consistent uh, read request. And uh, you can clearly see that eventual consistent read is uh, cheaper than strongly consistent uh, read, right? And uh, the size of each uh, read request uh, could be maximum of four KB. Okay, so if you take an example, uh, you know that will sink in, uh, uh, you know, much easily. So let's say uh, if you have an item size of eight KB you would require two read requests uh, to sustain one strongly consistent read and one read request if you choose eventually consistent read, okay? Or four uh, read request unit for transaction read request. Okay, so this is, uh, it's a simple match that uh, you might need to uh, do before you uh, you decide how, how much read uh, capacity unit and write capacity unit uh, you would need. And uh, similarly, for write capacity unit, uh, one write uh, for an item is can be up to one KB size. So let's say if you if 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 you if you think that your data would be of uh, 10 KB in size per second, then you would need uh, uh, 10 right uh, right uh, right request units. Okay, so it's uh, as simple as that. So just wanted to uh, touch base on this because when you create a uh, database, uh, sorry, when you create a table, uh, you'll be asked and you need to provide uh, you know that whether you want to go with uh, on-demand mode or provisioned mode, right? So with that, uh, let's get into uh, the demo. So I'll first show you in the console, and this is AWS console, and uh, what you can do is you can just search for DynamoDB. And can come to, you know, I've, I've been using for quite some time, so that's why, uh, you know, I was not getting this screen, but if you are doing it for the first time, if, if you are coming to DynamoDB for the first time, this would be the uh, uh, first screen that uh, you would probably see. Let's come to dashboard and uh, then uh, maybe table. And here I see that, uh, you know, there are two uh, tables exist. So, that might, uh, you know, we are going to use this in our demo for, uh, you know, uh, another uh, section maybe uh, a next section but uh, it seems that we already have two tables now what I'm going to do is I'll just show you how you can create a table through UI and then we'll get into CLI and uh, uh, through SDK so first is uh, you need to see uh, if you look here we are not creating a database right uh, because that is already there and uh, you know you don't have to worry about that all you have to do is when you come to DynamoDB is to create your table and get started with it Okay, so let's say I give a table name, let's say demo one, two, three. And uh, let's say you give some partition uh, key, you need to give one partition key. Uh, so this might be a primary key. So let's say ID. And it could be string, binary or number, any of these uh, three uh, data types. Uh, sort key also you can give, it's optional. If you remember, we, uh, we discussed about a sort key and the partition key, which makes a primary key, uh, but this is optional. So let's uh, let's skip it here, but we will use a, a sort key uh, when we do it through CLI, okay? So, and then uh, comes the interesting part. So here, when you select uh, default, uh, you know, uh, you, don't, uh, you don't get the opportunity to select uh, the read capacity unit and write capacity unit and you can just go ahead and create the table. But the moment you create, uh, click on customize setting, uh, you, would, you would get an option uh, to select uh, provisioned uh, uh, read capacity unit and write capacity unit, okay? So when you select on demand, it, it, nothing is asked. But the moment you select uh, provisioned, uh, you can say, uh, you know, how much uh, read capacity unit and write capacity unit you would need, okay? So now here, uh, it says that the read capacity unit auto scaling on. That means, you know, in case uh, uh, the read capacity unit reaches some threshold, what you want uh, uh, the DynamoDB to uh, do, okay? So if you say that the minimum is uh, one unit and maximum is 10 unit and threshold is 70, that means uh, you are telling DynamoDB, you start with one read capacity unit and see that, uh, you know, uh, how the workload is coming. The moment it reaches uh, 70%, just uh, you know, increase the read capacity unit, and how how far you can increase the maximum read capacity unit unit should be uh, ten. 
right? So this is just like, you know, how auto scaling uh, uh, work uh, in other services like EC2 instances, uh, but you have an uh, uh, you know option to go with auto scaling or you can simply switch it off and just say, let's say I want to go with 10 read capacity unit and maybe five, uh, you know, write capacity unit and you can go ahead with that. But, uh, you know, in this case, if uh, if uh, if your workload reaches this threshold uh, reaches this uh, number 10 you know then you will get uh, some throttling error okay so you need to keep that in mind all right so now you can click on on demand and uh, you can create a table so we are not going to create this table through ui we just want to show you uh, how easy it is uh, uh, to create a table and uh, another thing is uh, encryption at rest, as we mentioned uh, in the presentation, that uh, uh, you know all the data that is stored in DynamoDB is fully encrypted. So you can do it, uh, uh, you know, via different means. Uh, you can use your uh, custom key, you can use KMS, or you can use uh, DynamoDB's own uh, encryption, uh, you know, key. Okay. So let's cancel this wizard, and uh, now I'm going to go to CLI and uh, show you how you can create the table. So now first thing is, uh, you know, I wanted to show you uh, some uh, other service so that, you know, <laughs> this session becomes a, a, a very much uh, AWS native. And uh, not only that, this is a very good service that every developer should uh, make use of. Okay. And that is called Cloud9. So Cloud9 is an IDE uh, in the cloud. So you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, your laptop or desktop. Uh, you can just create an IDE, uh, create a uh, Cloud9 instance uh, on AWS and you can log into anyone's computer and log into your AWS account and you can start writing your code. Right. So that's the best way uh, to uh, work on cloud environment. So uh, so ID uh, Cloud9 is basically an EC2 instance uh, which it creates in the back end, but uh, it creates an instance on top of it. It, cre uh, it installs and configures lots of uh, tools and uh, packages so that you get a, a complete ID kind of feel. OK, so uh, you can I have already created one uh, and, uh, you know, I am going to use that. But again, if you want to create one, you can just click on create environment. You can give some name. Let's say my uh, dev system. And you can go click on next. You can select the instance type. So let's say T2 micro and you can uh, select the uh, operating system or the platform here. You don't see all the different operating system like Windows and all of that. Uh, uh, just like what you see when you create a virtual machine you know, like EC2 instance. But uh, that is fine because this is not that needed because this is for dev uh, development work, not for your production where you need uh, different varieties of operating system. But, uh, you know, you can just, uh, you know, use uh, Cloud9 for your uh, local work, right? And uh, then you can just come here and click on Next. And uh, you can just create this environment, okay? And it will take a couple of minutes because it is going to create an EC2 instance, and then it will install all the packages and uh, create an ID environment for you. Okay, so let me cancel this and uh, what we are going to do is we'll click uh, in open IDE and uh, the moment you click here, I, I've already opened it in a different tab. So uh, you would come here. Okay. So if you look here, uh, you will get a feel that this is kind of an IDE, right, which we typically uh, use. Uh, so you have an explorer window in the left side, you have a command line in the, in the bottom and uh, you have an editor you know, in the front. So that's a very nice way to uh, write your code. So, uh, so now what we are going to do is uh, we are going to uh, start with the CLI. So CLI is already uh, configured, and uh, if you if you have if you are doing this uh, in your laptop or your desktop, not in uh, uh, Cloud9, you may need to install AWS CLI, and you need to configure that. So, so you can just configure with this, and you, it will ask you for the secret access keys and then you can select the region as well and you can get started with it okay so i've already created this uh, you know configured this aws cli and aws cli was already installed because it was a cloud9 instance okay so i just thought to you know I, i'm very sure that you know all of this but just want to uh, make sure that uh, we all are in the same page uh, because if you are new then it might be a little uh, difficult to follow okay so uh, now that uh, uh, we have uh, the AWS CLI uh, installed and configured. Uh, we can just uh, run this uh, command, and this is to create a table. So now let's look at the options that it, it asks. Right? So it takes uh, 
uh, a parameter for table name and then it uh, ask for the definition right so like what are the attributes what are the uh, fields uh, that uh, it should have and uh, it also we need to uh, say that uh, you know uh, which is a primary key because that is the only thing that that is needed. You don't have to build a schema. You don't have to define a schema uh, while you create a table, right? So in this case, if you see here, uh, we are giving a primary key, um, uh, sorry, partition key as well as a hash key, right? And how we know this, uh, you can see this uh, that we are defining it as a pet ID as a range, uh, which you, if you remember, that is nothing but um, the sort key and uh, and pets. Uh, species which is a hash uh, key type which is uh, nothing but the partition key okay so and the billing mode is pay per year request okay so that is what we are, de are defining here so let's uh, copy this whole command and try to run it so if you see uh, let me just uh, close this because this might uh, hinder uh, in the visibility okay so if you see here uh, the table got created uh, right and how we can see uh, we can come here and if you if you refresh we should be able to see this new table All right now now let's uh, go to cli and try to describe or, or try to see the details about that table right so let's run this so the command is aws dynamodb describe tables and the table name it's very simple uh, and very much readable so it says that uh, uh, what are the keys that you have, right? Pet ID and uh, pet species is uh, are my keys. And what is the table name? And what is the billing uh, mode? And uh, what is the provision throughput? So this is uh, on demand. So that's why you see all zero here. And uh, you also get uh, the ARN, which is a unique ID uh, of this particular uh, resource uh, in AWS, okay, your account. So now that uh, uh, we have seen uh, some of the details about the table, which is nothing but the metadata, uh, let's see what are the other tables we have. So it's similar to, uh, you know, ls command in, in Linux, which shows the files and directories. Here also you can see the uh, all the tables. So we have three tables, and these are two which were already there, and this is the pet inventory which we have just created, right? So uh these th th this is a simple example but before we uh, delete this table i want to show you something in the ui maybe uh, so let's go to this table okay and now if you get the uh, live item count it should be zero because uh, uh, we don't have uh, you know any uh, uh, you know any item in this uh, table right so it, it's that's why it's saying uh, zero uh, but if you want to create an item or this is when I say create an item, it's nothing but you are trying to put one record okay, in this DynamoDB table. So just think of uh, for a moment that we have a partition key as well as a, a primary key as well as a sort key, right? So just uh, uh, think about a moment that uh, when we try to create an item, uh, what should be mandatory for us? Okay, so just give it, uh, you know, uh, pause the video and just think about it. Do you feel that uh, we need to uh, give both the uh, uh, both the attributes, or we can, uh, you know, go ahead with only one? Okay, so now if you see here, I just create, uh, clicked on create item, and if you see, uh, we already have both of these two, uh, you know, automatically. Uh, given and the reason it is uh, given is because we have defined it as uh, uh, the sort key and the uh, primary key as the partition key right so that means that we need to for all the items no matter what we need to give uh, these two uh, you know entities these two parameters okay or these two attributes we need to uh, give these two uh, parameters okay so without that uh, you cannot create any you know any item so if 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 you want to recall that uh, what that actually means is um, you know in this case artist and song title right these two are uh, are nothing but uh, the uh, the partition key and the sort key so for all the items these two are uh, had to uh, you know we need to have these two uh, keys right so uh, that that is something that is important to know that uh, although we don't have any schema but uh, whatever we 
at the time of creation of the table, uh, whatever is the primary key, uh, uh, you know, we need to adhere to that and we need to make sure that all item uh, is having those keys. OK, so let's cancel this. And now we are going to go to our dev environment and now we are going to uh, you know create a table um, and uh, put some records and query that uh, so, uh, you know query uh, send some query uh, in the table uh, through SDK okay so before we do that let's uh, delete this okay so delete command is uh, very simple it's just uh, the animal DB delete table and the table name so it got deleted so if you want to see uh, it got deleted we can again run list table and we see that that uh, you know the last table is no more right so now let's uh, try to create a table uh, through uh, python and we are using python but you are free, uh, you are free to use uh, any sdk of any uh, you know of your preferred language so in python we have an sdk called uh, boto3 and uh, you know boto3 is uh, the sdk in python through which you can access and uh, you know use any of the aws uh, resources okay so it's you need to install that and once you have installed it's very simple it's pip install boto3 and then you can import that and then you can uh, use that to uh, you know create your resources now we are having a, we, we have created a simple uh, function now which will uh, 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 which is there to create a table and the way that uh, we are going to uh, uh, create this is we need to first create a client so uh, the way we we can call an instance uh, we can create an instance of uh, dynamodb is using boto3.client and then you have to define the service name right so let's say if, if you wanted to uh, create an s3 client so then it would have been uh, maybe s3 client equal to boto3 dot client and s3 okay and then uh, you can do whatever uh, with this instance or the uh, uh, you know class object okay so so we are what we are doing here is uh, we are creating a dynamo db instance and then we are using a method called create table and here we are defining the uh, you know uh, uh, table keys right what is the part which is the partition key which is the sort key and uh, all the definition what what is the type like uh, whether it's a, a numeric or string or binary whatever it is okay and here we are using uh, provision throughput okay so we are using uh, read capacity unit of 10 and write capacity unit of 10 okay so it's not uh, on demand so uh, once this is done you are just returning this uh, table object Okay, so it's it's a pretty straightforward function where you just have to it's just two lines of code We have just to break it down so that it becomes easy for uh, you know reading But you just create a dynamo db client and you you just uh, call this create table method. Okay, so Now this is a function and uh, which we have created if I just minimize this function. This is a function So now to call that function uh, We create a table name. So let's say the table name is movie and we pass this table name to this create table uh, uh, function okay and then we can also uh, check for the status uh, whether the table got created or not or what is the status and we can just print this uh, status as table dot table status okay so let's try to run this script and see uh, how it works so i need to be in the right folder Okay, so let's see. Yeah, so let's try to run the create table. So now it's saying it's creating uh, because I just executed the very moment uh, that uh, uh, I created this uh, table. So now let's go to our UI and with so click on refresh and you see that there is already the table got created right this is already a there is a table called movie right and there is no items here again because we had just created this uh, uh, a table so now let's go back and next is we need to load some data okay so how we can load this data uh, so for this uh, uh, for this demo uh, you know i already have a json the you know data.json which is a very huge file which contains lots of lots of uh, you know data 
and what we are going to do is we are going to read that file and uh, we are going to write um, the uh, uh, the data from this file okay now this this is a very huge file so what i did is i i'm just reading the first 100 uh, you know items from that file and uh, i'm going to put that in the table okay so again it's a very simple uh, uh, script um, you know we are using this photo 3 uh, a resource dynamo db and then we creating a, a, a table right so we are we are not creating so but uh, you are just mentioning that uh, what is our, our table so our table is uh, movies which we have just created and uh, we are going to uh, put items we are going to use put items uh, uh, method to put the item in that table okay so we have created this table object and then we are just reading the data uh, from this file right and then we are just using the table dot put and the item okay and we are doing it for first 100 items so let's try to uh, run this this is the second part which is two underscore or two hyphen load data and you see that uh, you know data got loaded right so there are 100 uh, records uh, here so let's go back to ui and that's the best way we can see so let's get into movies and as you see that uh, you have all the data right which is your title and different info right if you want to see a particular item you can always click on that and you can see the json right so it has uh, different uh, attributes like uh, year title info actor and so on okay so you get the idea right so it contains everything uh, that uh, you want okay so now this is done so let's go back to our demo and then uh, let's see that how you can add a single item right because that is also something you would need uh, to do uh, when uh, over the period of time once you have set up once you have maybe loaded the initial set of data or yet maybe you are migrating from some other data database or any other source so the way that uh, uh, you know you put any uh, record or any item in DynamoDB, it's uh, exactly the same process. Uh, we have created a function where um, we will be giving the title, year, and plot and rating. So these are you know this is just for this particular function, but uh, you know you are free to uh, put uh, whatever you want, right? So uh, we again create a resource called DynamoDB uh, boto 3 dot resource DynamoDB. We select this table. And again, we say uh, put put item and all these parameters, right? Your title, info, or whatever uh, you have in your data. Okay, and uh, you just run it. So let's try to do this. Okay, so it got added. So that's that's how uh, simple it is uh, uh, to. Uh, put a record using a put item uh, method uh, into your table so the last thing is to how you can query so now that you have put all the data now how you will query so let's say you want to query for all the movies uh, uh, which were uh, released in in a particular year right so let's say 2013 right how you can do so so for this we have created a query uh, movies which will take just the year which is um, in this case 2013 and then again with the same thing uh, you know by now you 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 might have got the idea right you create a resource and then you uh, you know uh, select the particular table in this case it is movies so you create an instance of this and then uh, you just use table dot query methods this is the important thing uh, uh, it's just a one line of code it's table dot query and then uh, you give uh, what you want to query and what it should equal to so, right so it's key uh, we want to check for a uh, year and we just want to see that uh, it, whether it is uh, if it is equal to uh, the particular year which is 2013 then just uh, you know uh, give uh, the all the items okay so let's try to uh, run this and see what we get if you see uh, we got all the tables uh, all the movies which are of 2013 uh, time frame or 2013 release date. So let's uh, let's change this to let's say 2015 and uh, Let's run this again So we see that there is only one movie Okay in 2015 
So uh, this is as simple as that, right? How you can, uh, you know, read data from the DynamoDB table. And the, the reason that I've shown you through, uh, through SDK is uh, now that you know that how you can uh, create a resource instance, and uh, then how you can, uh, you know, read data and write data into a DynamoDB table, you can very well use this in your application and integrate it with a, a Lambda function, right? So because this is all you have to do, you need to, uh, create resource or client and then just uh, you know uh, play around with that okay with whatever data you want all right so last thing is let's uh, before we uh, you know wrap up for on dynamo db we should delete that uh, again it's a simple uh, um, function uh, there is a function called delete or a, sorry a method called delete you just have to create that instance first it's a table which is movies and then delete so let's try this And the table got deleted and uh, if you now come here you will not see that table okay so that's about it uh, about uh, dynamo db and uh, let me close this as uh, we are done with this so let me close this and let's come back to our dashboard and let's move on to the next topic now that we have learned a little bit about the different data sources in particularly we looked into how dynamodb works and how you can put your data through dynamodb uh, and uh, you know there are other uh, data sources as well uh, like connected device like iot device cameras uh, log streams etc now we need to uh, move forward to the ingest phase so in this phase uh, what happens is uh, you know your data sources uh, you know, push the data uh, for streaming, right? So the, uh, we are talking about online streaming. So in this ingest phase, there are different services uh, which uh, one can use, uh, and this is not at all an exhaustive list, but uh, we have services like database migration service, which are used for uh, database migration, as it as the name suggests. Uh, this, this is uh, the service that uh, which uh, you may like to use when you try to migrate your on-premise data, uh, database uh, to any database on AWS, then we have uh, AWS uh, Snowball, and uh, most importantly, we have Amazon Kinesis. So Amazon Kinesis is uh, a very important service of which uh, any data scientist or data analyst or data engineer should know. So if you want to do an online processing or real-time processing uh, of your data, uh, then uh, Amazon Kinesis is the service that uh, you should look for. So let's uh, look at uh, Amazon uh, Kinesis uh, with, uh, you know, in, in, in a bit more depth. So Kinesis is a managed alternative to Apache Kafka. That means that if you have worked on uh, Apache Kafka, th this should be very much familiar uh, to you. This is, uh, you know, it is just an alternative uh, to uh, Apache Kafka and it's completely managed. So you don't have to provision any instance. You don't have to configure, uh, you know, any any uh, machine behind it. You can just, uh, you know, create a Kinesis a stream and get started with it. OK, so this is very good for application logs, metrics, uh, IoT devices and clickstream uh, kind of data. And you can do all of this, uh, you know, uh, all of these analysis in real time. So there is no lag between the ingest and the analysis. So, uh, and, uh, and one, one a very important thing about uh, Amazon Kinesis is, is it has a very good integration with a few of the uh, processing frameworks and other services we have uh, in uh, AWS. So you can uh, make use of Kinesis uh, for online processing and analysis, and you can feed the data uh, to some different other services. And we are going to see that in action in the demo. And last but not the least, uh, the data that you have, uh, you know, that, that you send to, to Kinesis, uh, these are replicated across the AZ, so it, it's always doable. So you don't have to worry about uh, the data replication part of uh, from your side. Now, when you look at uh, Kinesis, uh, Kinesis is not a single service. It is a family of uh, service. Uh, now, if you uh, start from extreme left here, now we have Amazon Kinesis Data Stream, which is the core, and uh, th this is th this is a real-time uh, data streaming service uh, where you can just uh, you know connect your data source. Uh, it could be an SDK, it could be a log stream, it could be any producer library, anything, right? And uh, it can just take the data in, and you can do further analysis on that. 
Now, we, the, uh, and after that, you have Amazon Kings uh, data firehouse, and uh, this is not real time. It, it has a, a lag of 60 seconds, uh, although it's not that much, but uh, 60 seconds is the minimum amount of uh, lag that you would get uh, with Kinesis uh, data firehouse. Uh, but the best part about uh, firehouse is uh, you can send the data uh, back to different other services uh, like uh, S3, Redshift, uh, Elasticsearch, uh, uh, Splunk, and so on. Okay, and we are going to uh, you uh, create a, uh, Amazon Kinesis data firehouse in the demo, and uh, you would appreciate the fact that how seamlessly you can process your data uh, using Kinesis. And then you have uh, Amazon Kinesis Data Analytics. So in case, uh, th uh, this is an optional uh, service which you may like to use if you intend to do uh, uh, or use an SQL query on the live data that is coming uh, on Kinesis Data Stream, right? So if you, if you want to do a live query on the data as it comes in flight, uh, then you may like to use Amazon Kinesis Data Analytics. And then uh, we have uh, Amazon Kinesis data, uh, uh, video streams. So it is uh, just as the name suggests, it's for a video stream. Uh, that means that your source uh, source data uh, might be uh, uh, CCTV camera footage, uh, video streams and or video recordings. And it will just take uh, all the uh, video data into the stream. Now, since these are uh, various different services with, uh, with, uh, within Kinesis and you can use one or more or uh, all of them together depending on your use case. But uh, this is a typical, uh, uh, you know, uh, typical way that how people uh, would use. So the first is, uh, you know, the, your Kinesis data streams, which will get the data from various other sources like uh, uh, click stream data, IoT data, log matrices, etc and once the data uh, is there in kinesis data stream uh, you can run some sql query if you would like to uh, using amazon kinesis data analytics and once uh, that is done you can throw that data uh, uh, back to kinesis data firehouse which can ultimately uh, you know push the data and store the data and save the data in amazon s3 redshift or elasticsearch or many other third party uh, you know uh, frame uh, tools uh, like splunk and so on Okay, so this is kind of a general block diagram of how Kinesis uh, works together uh, with different uh, services. Now, one important thing to uh, understand is how Kinesis actually stores our data, right? Uh, and this is kind of a, a conceptual thing, but it is very important to uh, learn how Kinesis works uh, internally. So, in Kinesis, uh, every stream is made up of different shards. So the way that you can think of about shard is uh, you can think of it as partitions. And uh, you know you will be built uh, uh, with respect to number of partitions that you have or number of shards that you have. So more the shards you have, uh, the better performance uh, that uh, you will get. And uh, over the period of time, based on your usage and requirement, you can reshard or you can merge. Uh, uh, basically, you can scale out or scale in, uh, you know, in terms of the shards. And all the records are in order. Uh, you know, they are kept in order per shard. So it's not like um, the it, it maintains the order of the data that you are sending uh, to the Kinesis stream, uh, but it is ordered uh, with respect to every shard. So let's say if you have uh, 10 shards uh, in your uh, Kinesis data stream, uh, then all those 10 shards within that shard, the data will be in order. Okay, so this is how it it works. So let's say you have a producer, as we discussed before, the producer could be anything like a uh, and Python SDK or uh, logs or Kinesis uh, library or anything, right? Kinesis producer library, etc. So you can have uh, one or two or even more number of shards. Uh, so let's say uh, you have two shards and the moment the data comes in, uh, the moment it enters uh, the Kinesis data stream, uh, it will see that, okay, this particular stream has two shards. So what uh, it will do is, uh, Kinesis will do is, it will split the data across uh, two uh, shards so that they are, there is no hot shards uh, there inside the stream. And there are some best practices to do so, but uh, we'll not get into the details of that. But the idea is, uh, depending on the number of shards that you have uh, in a stream, uh, your data will be uh, distributed across all the shards. And once the data is in, in, the, in the shard or inside Kinesis, uh, your consumer can come and uh, you know, uh, read from that, uh, read from there. 
okay and in this uh, picture we are uh, we are showing you only one uh, uh, one uh, consumer but uh, you can always have uh, multiple uh, consumers so you can always have you know multiple number of consumers right so you can have some consumer one let's say there is consumer two consumer three and they all uh, make use of the same data that is coming right uh, into the uh, Kinesis data stream. Right? And one important thing to uh, remember is uh, uh, this the data uh, in this shard are immutable. That means that once the data is, uh, you know, once the data is, enters a, a stream, you cannot delete it. You cannot uh, delete or tamper anything. And that makes sense as well, right? So in terms of security as well, because these th this particular service is used for, uh, you know, real-time analytics, right? So when we think about real-time, that means, uh, take any example, let's say uh, server logs, right, or click stream. So you don't want to delete any data or you don't want any of your user to tamper with the data, right? Because it will hamper, uh, uh, you know, it will add hindrance uh, for you if you want to investigate something which has happened wrong in the past, right? So that's why, uh, you know, once the data enters the Kinesis data stream, uh, you cannot uh, change it. So there is some retention period that the data stays uh, inside the uh, uh, stream. Uh, so. I guess it was uh, previously it was uh, uh, the maximum number of days that it can hold the data is seven days, but now I guess it is uh, one year. Um, and but by default it is I guess 24 hours. If if I'm not wrong, yeah, you can check out the documentation. But uh, I guess the uh, minimum number uh, the default is 24 hours and the maximum is uh, uh, one year. So during that uh, uh, whole span of uh, uh, time, whether it's 24 hours or two days or seven days or one year, whatever uh, you configure the stream with uh, the data uh, won't uh, leave that stream, right? And you can use, you, multiple consumers can use that data. And it's not like uh, if one consumer, let's say if one consumer uh, has processed a chunk of data, um, the other consumer, this consumer, C2, uh, uh, cannot, uh, you know, consume that. It's not like that. So every consumer can independently consume the same set of data, which is there inside the uh, stream, okay? So that's about uh, uh, Kinesis, um, uh, Amazon Kinesis, uh, Amazon Kinesis data stream, uh, Amazon Kinesis Firehose, and we are going to see that in action in the demo in some time. So once uh, we are done with the ingestion, um, the next part is the storage. And as we discussed uh, multiple times, uh, you know, in the first part, uh, the core storage that we use in data lake uh, in AWS is S3. So Amazon S3 is uh, is the more one of the most secure, uh, highly scalable and durable object based storage that we have, uh, you know, uh, across the industry, right? And it has uh, eleven nine durability. Uh, it's very simple to use, and you can store as much of data uh, you want, and uh, you get a very good performance all right and the most importantly you can store any type of data you can uh, you know uh, you can uh, you know, save or dump uh, your log uh, data which is unstructured you can have a semi structured data you can even uh, you know store your structured data like sql uh, sorry like uh, csv or parquet format data so you you will in your data lake uh, you will have s3 as a central repository where you will store all the data and then you will make use of other services come and talk to s3 okay and we are going to see that uh, in the demo as well uh, how we query data in which is which is present in s3 and uh, last but not the least, um, uh, Amazon S3 uh, uh, provides and gives you various different types of uh, uh, storage type, uh, like uh, S3 standard, S3 infrequent access, uh, then S3 glacier. And uh, depending on uh, your need, uh, you can use any of these storage classes. Uh, most most commonly you will be using st standard but let's say um, yeah, your use case says that uh, you need to move the data uh, from st standard to maybe s3 infrequent access after seven days and maybe after one month you need to move it to uh, glacier so you can always do so you can make use of uh, the s3 lifecycle management which can help you to, to automate this whole uh, you know uh, data movement within different types of uh, or different class of storage within s3 
So once the data is there in S3, the uh, next interesting thing, and this is one of my favorite service that uh, yeah, you can do is uh, uh, data catalog and ETL, yeah, ETL jobs. So this is done by a service called AWS Glue, which is a completely serverless uh, service, which can help you to catalog your data and also it can help you to do uh, ETL jobs. So there are a lot of times, uh, you know, in uh, machine learning in particular, you need to, uh, you know, or, uh, you need to make uh, the data in the right format. Uh, so you can make use of uh, AWS Glue uh, to do so. Uh, I mean, there are multiple ways that you can do, but uh, this is, uh, 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 you know, one of the way that you can automatically discover the schema uh, of the data. So the way that it works is uh, you have your S3, right? and you have your data inside your S3 bucket. Now, you don't know what type of data it has, right? So it, it, it's kind of a, a black box for you. Let's, let's assume like that, okay? And now uh, you want to uh, run some query, let's say using SQL. Now you cannot do so, right? Because you, don't, you have no visibility about the type of data that you have. All right. So now what you can do is before even uh, running a, any SQL query, you can use Glue. And what Glue does is it will crawl through the whole data. OK, it will crawl through your uh, whole bucket and it will check uh, what type of data it has and, uh, you know, what, uh, you know, what are the attributes and all of that. And at the end of the day, Glue will give you one schema. OK, it will give you one schema and then you can write an SQL query uh, or you can do an SQL query on that particular schema. Right. So uh, it, it will help you to discover the type of data that you have uh, in your S3 bucket and uh, it will create the table for you. And once you have that table, then you can uh, use Athena. Uh, Athena to uh, to query your data that is stored in S3 using SQL. OK, and we are going to see that in the demo, uh, you know, in some time now. So uh, this is about uh, schema discovery and data cataloging, but uh, it can do a lot more. It can also uh, transform your data like uh, it can convert your data from CSV to Parquet format. You can create your own uh, script uh, uh, in an ETL job and so on. So uh, we will look into that once we uh, start the demo. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, you start, we, we started with uh, a data source, then uh, we looked into uh, ingestion, then we looked into the storage, which uh, we use to store that data. The, then we also uh, looked into Glue, uh, where you can do the cataloging and schema discovery. And ultimately, uh, the reason that we did all of this is uh, we should be able to process it uh, and analyze it in a much better, a smarter way. Now, there are different services uh, that we have in the process and analyze stage, uh, like EMR, uh, Elastic Map Reduce, uh, Redshift, which is for data warehouse, Elastic Search, and so on. But uh, what are the services that uh, uh, which people generally use, uh, uh, who are from data science uh, and data and, uh, engineering background, is uh, Amazon uh, Athena. So. Uh, we just discussed about uh, Amazon Athena a while back. So what it it will do is, or what it can do is, uh, it can help you to do interactive query to analyze the data that is stored in S3. So oftentimes you will see that uh, uh, Athena and Glue are, uh, you know, are talked uh, together. You know, everywhere you go, you'll always find Athena and Glue. People are talking about it in, you know, in, uh, in conjunction. And the reason being is, uh, you know, Glue is used to, uh, you know, discover the schema and uh, type of data and discover the table and create the table, etc. And once that is done, then you can use Athena to query that data, all right? So uh, that's why, uh, you know, uh, Glue and Athena is uh, one of the favorite tool for any data scientist or uh, data engineer. And it supports various different formats of data um, and it's very, very easy to use. 
All right, so now that uh, we have learned about uh, all these uh, stages, the last stage is, uh, you know, how we finally consume that data. So there are uh, different ways that you can visualize that data, what you have analyzed and processed. One of the uh, uh, quick way would be uh, uh, using Amazon QuickSight, uh, which is a dashboard, uh, 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 you know, kind of service where you can just uh, pull in any of the data source and uh, you can you can look at the data in a much meaningful and soothing manner, right? So we are going to uh, see some uh, demo with QuickSight, uh, maybe in the next part, where you will we will um, uh, have, have some uh, demo uh, where we will be showing some uh, how uh, a data, uh, you know, data lake uh, uh, or data pipeline can be used in your game development and how it can effectively increase your efficiency in game a game development process. So it's a, a real application and we are going to see how you can use a quick site there. Okay, and uh, you know, a quick site is just one example. Uh, uh, your analyzed and processed data can be consumed uh, for machine learning, or maybe uh, in a Jupyter notebook or using an API uh, gateway and so on, right? So, you, uh, I mean, you get the idea. This is uh, mostly dependent on uh, your use case, but uh, the most important part is, uh, you know, how you uh, ingest the data uh, and how you store the data, how you catalog and process and analyze. All right, so, uh, I guess uh, now it's a good time uh, that we should go uh, to the console and look for some demos uh, on the uh, on the things that we have just discussed. Okay, so let me close this uh, presentation. All right. So before uh, we jump into the demo, uh, we have uh, you know a couple of small small demos um, before we get into a, a bigger demo at later uh, point on uh, game development. Uh, I just thought to uh, share the documentation for Kinesis as well. So this is the uh, developer guide for Kinesis uh, data uh, stream, and uh, you can read about all the concepts that we have learned. And uh, there are lot of things that we have not touched upon, but uh, this is the place that uh, you should go and learn about it. So. This is a fantastic diagram which shows that how Kinesis uh, um, actually works at a very high level. Uh, you have shards, uh, data can come in from different sources, and then you can consume it uh, via different services. Okay, I just want to uh, uh, you know, share you, you know, uh, uh, the documentation so that uh, you can uh, continue the learning uh, from uh, here on. Okay, so the first, uh, uh, the first uh, uh, demo that. Uh, uh, we are going to see is uh, on Glue and Athena. So we have created uh, uh, an S3 bucket. So let me first go to S3. Okay, so uh, we have a bucket called AWS Glue Summon. Okay, and inside that we have multiple folders and there is a folder called sales data and we have a sales a csv file right so now the idea is uh, we need to uh, uh, query the uh, the data uh, this particular data so how we can do so for that we need to go to the uh, glue console so we can search for glue from here okay i'm not clicking here because we already have opened it and if you see in the left hand side there are uh, different categories here uh, we have data cataloging, we have ETL, security, and tutorials. So we'll look into ETL uh, in a moment, but for now, uh, let's go to crawler. And there is uh, already one crawler which is there, which we, uh, you know I was using for uh, another demo. But uh, uh, to create a new crawler, uh, you can just click on uh, uh, add crawler. And what we are doing here is basically we are trying to create an agent or a crawler uh, which will help us to go to the S3 bucket and uh, try to figure out, uh, you know, uh, what data uh, it has and, uh, you know, uh, help us to create the table. So this is what uh, we are telling Glue to create using a crawler. So we'll give some name. So let's say sales underscore crawler. And next is it is asking that uh, what type of uh, crawler is, this is. Uh, so we are going to uh, provide some data source and the data source would be an S3 bucket. And there are other sources which are available like JDBC, uh, DynamoDB, Amazon DocumentDB, MongoDB and so on. So 
since we are selecting S3, we can specify the path. So we can click on this icon, go to the right bucket, select the sales data. So we have, uh, you know, it's a hierarchy, right? And we don't have to give the uh, a file itself because it might so happen that you have multiple files. So you don't have to create uh, a multiple number of or more number of uh, crawlers. You can just create uh, one crawler and uh, select the source as this so that, uh, you know, it can crawl through all the CSV files that it has inside it. So let's go with this and let's click next. Uh, we don't want to add any other data source. And now this is important. We need to uh, give some uh, IAM role because uh, uh, what would eventually happen is uh, the glue is going to go, uh, you know, to S3 and read the data, right? So we need to uh, provide access to glue so that it can access the, uh, our bucket. So that's why uh, uh, that's what uh, this particular service role is about. And last uh, is uh, what would be the frequency now? Imagine that, uh, you know, you imagine that you in this particular case, you have an S3 bucket and you have sales.csv, right? Nothing else. Uh, now, in real time or real world uh, use case, uh, your data will be continuously getting updated. All right. And you need to make sure that, uh, you know, your crawler is also updated. So that's the reason uh, you may like to add a frequency so that uh, you can tell the crawler that, hey, you should run every night at uh, 12 o'clock so that every day morning when I come and uh, do some query using Athena, I always get the updated results, right? So you need to make sure that the crawler is, uh, you know, uh, or executed or crawler is uh, run uh, in a, uh, you know, right frequency. So in this demo, uh, for, uh, for the sake of it, we can just select run on demand, right? We don't have to uh, make any schedule. Or a scheduler and uh, the last stage is we have to uh, you know add a database now this database not is not a relational database or no SQL database or any database that we know in uh, a, you know in real mean so this is kind of a virtual uh, you know a placeholder which will just store the schema of the tables that it discovers okay so we can create a table uh, let's say my DB again this is not a actual database it's just a placeholder to uh, you know save the metadata and all of that next uh, we can give some uh, uh, prefix let's say uh, demo underscore okay and then click next and then click finish and uh, now we can select this uh, crawler and click on run crawler since we have used uh, that uh, this uh, crawler should run uh, on demand, that's why we had to uh, run this manually. Otherwise, if you have put a scheduler, then it would, uh, you know, uh, run as per the schedule. Okay, so let's uh, uh, give it a moment or so. So what is happening uh, under the hood is now, uh, Glue crawler uh, is going to, uh, you know, check that particular bucket which we have uh, given, and uh, it is going to uh, learn what type of data it is, what uh, you know, what are its fields, and will create a table out of it, right? And uh, the same table we are going to uh, use uh, for querying uh, using Athena. So as, as of now, it, it has just started, and you see that the number of tables added is zero. So uh, we should expect. Uh, one table because uh, inside this particular uh, uh, path uh, inside this bucket we just have one csv file right if we had two csv files we would have expected uh, you know two tables uh, but let's wait for a couple of minutes and see that if it is able to detect the table or not in the meantime let me refresh this So as you can see here it already detected one table and the table got added as well so let's uh, go to our table and see if the table is here or not. Let's, uh, let's go to the database. We have the database. Now, if you click on table, the database, uh, let's click refresh and we see this table, right? So we, if you remember, we use this demo underscore as a prefix. That's why the name has come like this and it has automatically detected the column name and not only that it has also detected uh, the data type 
and uh, in fact you can also edit this schema if you feel that uh, data type that it has automatically discovered is not correct you can always uh, click and change the column type okay so most of the time you will not do that but uh, if you if you see any ambiguity you know, this is the place that uh, you should come and edit that okay so now that uh, uh, you know we have our crawler which has already detected and we have a table now we can query this table using athena so let's go to athena and we should select the database and if you see here it is already detected on that table uh, from clue and we can click on preview table and uh, we can run the query and we can see that it is able to query the data all right so uh, here uh, you can uh, run any query uh, of your wish uh, now let's say we say that we want to see uh, all the uh, items uh, where the sales is uh, more than let's say 5000 and let's run this query and you see that uh, all these uh, you know uh, these items uh, is are the items where the sales is more than 5000 right so this is the way that uh, you can make use of athena and glue for any ad hoc query or uh, you know to uh, you know do any analysis on your data all right so now uh, let's go back to uh, glue and uh, we have learned about crawler and how you can query with athena now let's look into uh, the etl jobs so let's come to job so we don't have uh, any jobs uh, running so there is one job which i've created as a part of uh, another demo which we are going to see in the next part but uh, for for an etl uh, task like uh, where you want uh, glue to extract transfer tra uh, load and transfer uh, trans transfer your data to uh, to uh, uh, to I mean to completely transform your data to a different form uh, you can create a job so when you create a job um, you know for this particular uh, demo what we are trying to do is uh, we will try to convert the CSV file into a parquet format okay so if you remember this s3 bucket we have a CSV file right uh, under this uh, sales data we we would try to uh, you know convert this into a parquet format and parquet is a columnar based storage and it is very very efficient in terms of performance as well as in terms of uh, uh, cost so it doesn't have to do uh, i mean your uh, query time uh, decreases a lot and you can save uh, a good amount of uh, uh, money so let's try to convert that uh, data to parquet format so let's uh, give a job name let's say sales uh, CSV to parquet and we need to give one role similar I mean just like before and it will automatically create a, a spark uh, script we don't have to edit uh, anything although if you want you can always uh, you know edit that but you don't have to edit that so uh, then you can come down and you can click on next And uh, here you would like to uh, select uh, the data store. So this is the uh, data source, source data. This is uh, demo underscore uh, sales data. Uh, we click next. Uh, so we need to change the schema, click on next. and then we would like to uh, now here it's asking that uh, where we want to uh, save the data right so you can select uh, s3 and you can uh, you know uh, give the path so uh, let's say we say that we want the clue inside sales data itself okay inside that there is only uh, there is only one file that's why it is not showing the uh, folder so uh, but let's select uh, the sales uh, data itself right and uh, in fact we can also create a folder called uh, parquet 
so that we know exactly uh, where the data is stored. And uh, here it just uh, shows the schema, right? So this is the source and this is the target. It automatically detected which are the columns that it should convert, right? So now we can save and edit the script. So it will generate a script for us. And this is the script and uh, which we need to save. And you can always modify this script. You don't have to worry about this uh, Spark script, uh, but it's a pretty uh, simple script to uh, convert the file into uh, uh, into parquet so you need to save this file uh, and then run the job so let's uh, wait for uh, one minute or so uh, i think it should be able to convert that so once the data is converted into parquet after that uh, we can again uh, uh, you know query the data using glue and athena just to uh, you know, uh, for, for our self confirmation that the data is still the same, it's just the format has changed, right? So uh, we will try that as well. Uh, but let's uh, wait for this job to get over. But in the meantime, we can go to uh, uh, the S3 bucket here inside the sales data and uh, let's refresh. still going on uh, let's wait for some time so you see that uh, there is a folder uh, which got created called parquet and inside that uh, uh, we have a file so let's see uh, i guess it got over and if we get inside this this is the parquet data all right so now what we can do is uh, we can uh, try to uh, run an sql query on this and uh, uh, see that if the data is still the same or not right so let's uh, let's try this out so for this again, we need to go to uh, glue. So we can close this. We can add a crawler again. And this time it's, let's say, uh, parquet crawler. Next, next, we need to give the Folder name where we have this data. Okay, so let's select this. Next, uh, same role. I'm not repeating this because uh, you know uh, we have already done that. Uh, let's use the same database. You don't have to create a separate database every time, um, but we can use a different uh, 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 prefix. So let's say parquet. Click on finish. Uh, so once this is done, um, we can select this and run the crawler. So let's wait for a couple of minutes. So again, uh, the glue is doing the same thing. Uh, it is now going to a different location, which we have just mentioned. Uh, previously, it was uh, you know searching here, and but now we have uh, asked the crawler to search inside this uh, path, right? So, um, uh, and once it's able to identify uh, the file, it should be able to detect and uh, create the table schema. So let's wait for a minute. You come to database here in the meantime click on this click on this my db you see that uh, there is uh, th there is no other table there is the same table which got created before so let's refresh this it's still running
Let's refresh now. Still going on. In the meantime, let's see if in the database we see anything. Okay, we see that there is a, a table called parquet parquet because we use that parquet as a prefix. Uh, you know, the name came like this. It's a little weird, but uh, uh, but you you get the idea, right? So it's also able to discover the column names uh, as we have seen before. So let's see, let's wait for the crawler to get uh, uh, completed. So now it is in the stopping stage and it has already discovered one table. So this is the right time to go to Athena and uh, refresh. And we should be able to see the other table, right? So now we see that parquet underscore parquet. And if we query that, it should be able to uh, send that query. And this is just like any other database. Uh, but uh, you know your, your query will become much more efficient now so because the data that uh, it's reading it's in the parquet format not in csv all right so this is about uh, the uh, athena glue um, uh, how you can make use of uh, uh, you know sql to query your data which is stored in s3 uh, as well as how you can uh, create an etl job using glue uh, to convert the data uh, from csv to parquet or from any format to parquet okay so uh now uh, we are done uh, with this and uh, one last uh, uh, demo uh, which uh, uh, we are going to uh, see is using kinesis uh, firehose okay so uh, what we are going to do is uh, we are going to create uh, a kinesis data firehose and uh, we are going to uh, push uh, some uh, amazon review data in that stream Okay, and uh, after that, uh, we are going to use uh, 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 Comprehend, uh, which is a machine learning uh, uh, service to analyze the uh, review so that we know that uh, the data that it is, uh, you know, the, the review that we are getting from our customers uh, are of positive sentiment or negative sentiment or mixed sentiment. Okay, so it's basically, uh, you know, analysis of uh, the live customer review data. Okay, so we are going to use a lambda function, uh, which uh, we want uh, to get triggered uh, when the data uh, comes in or when the uh, uh, you know customer review comes in. So for that, first uh, let's look into um, the lambda function. Okay, then we will come back to uh, the firehouse. So let's type lambda. And uh, we can go to this Lambda function. And I have a, a Lambda function called product review sentiment. And if you click on this, uh, you will see the Lambda function. OK, so this Lambda function is a pretty uh, you know, straightforward uh, function. Uh, what we are doing is we are creating a comprehend client. Okay, and we are importing a few of the, few of the libraries which we are going to use. And uh, one of the important thing, uh, you know, libraries we are using base 64 because uh, the data is uh, encoded with uh, uh, base uh, 64. Uh, we need to decode that. That's why we are using this uh, library. Go to three is, as we know, it is the Python SDK for uh, for AWS. Or <coughs> excuse me. If you want to access any resource uh, within AWS using Python, uh, you should use Boto3. So the first thing that you are doing is uh, we are creating a client object uh, for Comprehend service, right? The way that you do it is uh, like this. Uh, you type Boto3.client and then the service thing. If you want to create a client for S3, uh, in place of this, uh, you will just uh, use S3, okay? So that's how uh, you create a client object. And then uh, you have this Lambda function, uh, Lambda handler and uh, uh, this is the event and this event will have all the records right so here the records are nothing but uh, the uh, customer feedback right so what you do is uh, you first uh, decode that uh, data uh, which is there which you are getting from uh, the event handler all right and uh, we are we are running a, a, a for loop because it might happen that uh, uh, you know within uh, within a particular amount of time uh, it might receive more number of reviews right because a firehouse 
as we uh, as we have seen uh, that it has a lag of 60 seconds so it might happen that uh, within that 60 seconds uh, there a lot of data has come in right so you need to process all the reviews so that's why we are uh, running as a, in the for loop and uh, the way that um, we are going to analyze um, the sentiment is uh, we are going to read the heading headline as well as the uh, review body so if you look at amazon.in or amazon.com and if you have ever reviewed any pro uh, product uh, you might have seen that uh, uh, you know you as a user uh, get the opportunity to um, give a header or headline for your review as as well as the body of the review where you put uh, you know your detailed uh, review but there are a lot of times uh, people just uh, uh, give the headlines or they there are a lot of times people just give the uh, write something in the review body so we just uh, want to be uniform across uh, all the reviews so that's why uh, before we uh, run uh, uh, you know detect sentiment uh, api call uh, we are just concatenating uh, both the headline and the review body okay so once this is done uh, we are just uh, trying to uh, get the sentiment of this uh, of that particular uh, string and we are just taking the first uh, 4000 uh, you know characters i think uh, that's good enough to understand uh, uh, you know what is the sentiment of the comment or, or the review and then uh, what we are doing is uh, we are just uh, appending uh, uh, you know the sentiment and uh, in in a new hash in the payload itself and uh, then we will just encode uh, the payload and we will just uh, append that uh, record okay and we will just return that output okay that's a simple uh, uh, you know lambda function uh, which uh, uh, firehose is going to use uh, uh, when we create the uh, firehose data stream okay so now that we, uh, we have seen this lambda function uh, let's go to uh, kinesis and uh, we already have a kinesis uh, a data firehose but uh, i'll show you how you can create one so you click on create uh, delivery stream and you give some name let's say uh, uh, my firehouse uh, stream and if you see here in the uh, in this uh, small diagram uh, you need to give some source right and uh, source is nothing but uh, uh, the uh, the entity which will push data uh, to the firehouse data stream or, or firehouse delivery stream so there are two uh, uh, two ways that you can uh, inject data to a firehouse one is through direct uh, put which we are going to use in this demo we are going to use a python sdk to push the customer review data uh, uh, and that would uh, i mean that comes under the direct put category but you can always use a uh, kinesis data stream as an input or a source so in that case you have to uh, create the data stream beforehand and you can uh, select the right data stream from here so for this demo we are going to use uh, uh, you know python sdk so that's why we are selecting direct put and uh, then you can also do a server side encryption where we are uh, you know not doing it uh, for this particular demo but uh, there is an option that you can use uh, the aws uh, kms uh, to create and manage all of your keys so you click on next so now this is very interesting now once in the first stage you selected the source now the data has come inside the uh, Kinesis data firehouse. Now in this uh, firehouse, uh, within the firehouse, you can do two things. You can transform uh, your source rec uh, records and you can also convert your uh, you know, record format. So what do we mean by transform? Transform means uh, as the data come in, uh, you can use some uh, or you can invoke some Lambda function, uh, which can uh, you know transform your data. And we are going to use uh, the Lambda function. So for that, uh, you just enable it and you can select the uh, you know right uh, lambda function so for us it was product review sentiment so what we are essentially saying is as and when customer reviews are coming to uh, to you you should first transform the data that means you uh, you do something in this case we are doing uh, uh, the sentiment analysis of that comment and we send that ba uh, data back so we we are just telling that hey lambda you run this and once you are done with your execution of sentiment analysis, just uh, send me the updated data with your, uh, you know, sentiment analysis, uh, you know, in a input, right? So uh, this is what this Lambda function uh, would do to transform your source data records, okay? 
and once that is done we can convert the data so that means uh, you can um, you know enable uh, the convert uh, record type and you can convert it to either uh, orc or parquet so we are not going to do that but there is an option to do so so uh, in a nutshell in firehose uh, you can feed the data using direct put or using uh, kinesis uh, data stream and uh, within the firehose you can do two things one is you can transform the job uh, uh, by invoking a lambda function in our case you are going to invoke a lambda function which will uh, give you the sentiment or which will uh, which will do the sentiment analysis of the data and then you can also convert the data to different format so you can you can either convert the data to parquet or you can convert the data to orc so for, in our demo we are not going to do that so let's click next and finally um, we are done with the source we are done with the uh, firehose delivery stream and ultimately uh, the target you need to select so that means where sh where should i uh, put the data in right so what is the destination so as we discussed uh, you know firehose uh, supports uh, uh, you know few uh, different services as a destination like s3 redshift elastic search endpoint and there are third party providers so in the third party providers we have datadog dynamo db uh, new relic and splunk okay so for our case uh, we are going to use s3 and uh, within this s3 uh, you know you can select the bucket uh, that uh, you want to uh, you know store the data so let's select uh, aws glue and uh, you can also do a give some prefix so uh, let's say um, uh, you want to give some prefix uh, for uh, the process data as well as you want to give some prefix to, uh, in case the processing uh, get failed uh, you can have some prefix let's say error right and you can give some prefix uh, for the data which were already processed uh, so let's say processed right uh, you can give uh, whatever um, uh, you want and last but not the least you can also enable backup right so you if you if you see the block diagram uh, it says that once the data is processed you can uh, save the data in s3 not only that uh, you can also uh, you know uh, save uh, the uh, data if uh, if the processing fails and optionally you can also enable backup right so you can just uh, you know save the data as it comes so there are different options available uh, where you can use s3 as a destination for process data for data uh, which uh, got failed uh, while processing uh, that uh, it has received from the source right so uh, which is nothing but uh, the backup right so after that uh, you can come here and click on next uh, we need to disable that we don't want this so let's click on next and uh, then uh, comes the uh, you know most important thing so as we discussed that uh, firehose is uh, not uh, a real time uh, you know it has uh, it has some uh, you know a buffering time or uh, uh, you know it it it, it 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 cannot analyze your data in real time right so the reason being is uh, you need to give uh, a buffer interval which is uh, in minimum at minimum it's uh, 60 seconds right and uh, you can also uh, set the size uh, so let's say it's a uh, 1 MB so that means whichever uh, you know come first or whichever is figured first uh, you know after that uh, firehouse is going to process the data right but it's not at all a uh, real time uh, so here we are setting the buffer size as 1 MB and that means we are just waiting for 1 MB of data to come in uh, and uh, we are also setting the time interval that is we are just we have to wait for 60 seconds in the minimum right so whichever comes early uh, you know after that it will be uh, you know picked up and the data will be processed now there are different compression and encryption uh, you know strategies uh, which we support uh, like uh, uh, gzip or snappy if you're using parquet snappy uh, might be a good option it goes pretty nice with uh, parquet kind of data uh, data type and then uh, you can also enable uh, your uh, encryption and uh, last but not the least uh, you need to give a, a IAM role and that is uh, uh, a kind of uh, a regular thing for any AWS service when you want one service to talk to another service like in this case uh, you are 
uh, you're telling Kinesis to go and you know read data uh, from S3, uh, and not only that, you are also telling Kinesis to uh, uh, you know trigger and lambda function uh, you know uh, on your behalf. So you should give all the access control, and uh, and you don't have to worry about all of that permissions. You can just uh, uh, click on create an IAM role, uh, and it will automatically get created. So after that, you click on next. And you can just review all the data that uh, you have put in and you can click on create delivery stream okay so we are not going to create the delivery stream i just want to show you how i have created uh, uh, the one which we have here that is customer review uh, uh, stream and uh, now the next thing that we are going to do is uh, we are going to push uh, data to this uh, 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 data stream right uh, uh, data firo stream so uh, for this, uh, what uh, we are uh, going to do is we are, uh, we are going to open uh, Jupyter Notebook. So this is uh, Jupyter Notebook that we have, and this is also uh, running in uh, SageMaker, right? So if you are new to uh, SageMaker, uh, SageMaker is the machine learning service that we have where you can create a uh, Jupyter Notebook instance where you can run your uh, code. So if you if you are interested to see that how I have come here, um, um, you can search for SageMaker. Okay, so I have already opened, so I'm not clicking there, but uh, uh, this this would be the welcome screen, and inside that, in the left hand side, you will see uh, Jupyter Notebook and then Notebook Instance. You can create your instance. I have already created this, and that's why you know when I click on um, Open Jupyter Notebook, uh, I will. Um, come to this page okay so there are a lot of uh, folders i have created because i have been using uh, this uh, uh, notebook instance for quite some time uh, but uh, if you are doing it for the first time you will not find any folders here so inside that uh, i have one folder called data engineering inside this i have a customer review sentiment firehouse uh, notebook so which is uh, this we have a bunch of libraries here uh, which we are going to inst uh, you know import uh, so let's run this and the first thing that we are going to do is we are going to download uh, the customer uh, review data for cameras so uh, the thing is uh, you know this this uh, uh, this review data is uh, is from the open source uh, data set which we have let me try to uh, grab that uh, location and let me show you uh, the data set so this is a page uh, uh, you know s3 amazon aws.com amazon uh, review uh, pds slash readme.html so it contains uh, you know uh, all the details about uh, the data set uh, what type of data it has etc so it has lots of data uh, for different categories for games uh, uh, so for toys for cameras and so on and uh, for the uh, for the sake of uh, this particular demo we are just going to uh, download uh, you know the camera uh, data set so that means all the uh, reviews for the camera okay so let's uh, wait for some time uh, so it got downloaded uh, next is we are going to read this data and we are using pandas to read this so we are just uh, using panda uh, pd dot uh, read csv and the file name and uh, once that is done we are going to see uh, you know what, what that particular data frame contains so it's done let's see so it has uh, 15 columns and it has uh, uh, a huge amount of uh, reviews right it's uh, more than almost 1 million uh, records that it has right so just uh, let's have a sneak peek of uh, all the records right so if you see here we have uh, a review headline and uh, we have a review body right so these are the two columns that we are interested in right and uh, but there are cases where uh, you we will see that uh, uh, there might be a no review or uh, a no head headline so we can uh, you know remove them so we are just doing that here we are just uh, you know embedding new lines and tabs uh, we are just replacing the new lines tabs and so on so 
on the uh, you're just trying to clean the data set right so the next is uh, we are going to push the data to Firehose. this that's uh, that's why we have come here right so for that we import photo 3 we create a session uh, uh, session is because uh, you know that session instance or ses ses a session object will have all the context of uh, you know the present state i'm running uh, with right so it will contain uh, the region i am in it will uh, contain the context of this particular session this particular notebook and uh, you know we can make use of that session to create an instance of uh, different uh, services like here we are using so, uh, session dot client firehose we can always use boto3 dot client uh, firehose but uh, you know this is a much better way to use it so let's create a firehose uh, client object and uh, we need to give the right name of the kinesis uh, firehose data stream so let's go back and see the name so the name is customer review uh, stream let's go back to the console uh, to notebook and replace this with that name it's exactly the same name and then uh, what we are doing is uh, we are well, we are going to push uh, uh, this data to firehose okay so what we are doing is we are just reading the first uh, uh, 100 records and we are going to push uh, to the kinesis data stream right and we are just the way that we push it is uh, we call this client uh, underscore firehose right uh, which is this client right which is nothing but a firehose client and then we use the put record method right so let me just align this so that it becomes more readable yeah so we are just uh, using put record uh, method inside that we are just sending uh, the kinesis stream name and the record right so we are pushing 100 records so let's run this so when you do this uh, what happens is uh, you know we we are actually uh, pushing data uh, to kinesis right so uh, now this data should be visible to kinesis but since uh, we know that uh, you know kinesis wait for uh, 60 seconds or 1 MB whichever uh, comes uh, first uh, you know we can push uh, more data so in fact uh, uh, we can always uh, uh, push more than 100 records let's say 200 records right so these all are the reviews and uh, we are getting uh, response 200 so it should be all good and now uh, we can go to uh, Kinesis Firehose and we can see that in this uh, Kinesis Firehose uh, one of the things that uh, I forgot to uh, you know show you is that when you come to this uh, Firehose uh, you can see the source which is nothing but direct put we can also uh, see any transformation uh, that we are doing or not so in this case we are doing a transformation using this product review uh, uh, sentiment uh, lambda function and it also tells you where we are you know storing the data right um, so we are storing this uh, data in aws uh, glue air uh, suman uh, uh, bucket right so if you come to uh, this lambda function which uh, the firehose uh, should trigger uh, we can come to monitor okay so let's uh, refresh this and uh, see that it got executed or not you can see in the logs uh, and also we, we can see in the s3 bucket where the process data uh, should be uh, stored right so uh, let's uh, uh, go to uh, the uh, process data but before that we can see that there is a uh, you know a log which has come up and it's just uh, now uh, because now it's uh, 12 12 it is the time here is 12 11 uh, let's see what we have inside and if you see that uh, in the logs we have all the uh, 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 reviews as well as it's uh, their comments uh, uh, th their sentiments right and the reason that uh, we have this uh, printed in the log is because if you go to the uh, lambda function you will see that uh, we have actually printed the review and we have actually printed the sentiments all right so we already uh, you know are doing this in the 
in the lambda function and that's why it is coming in this lab so our uh, so a lot of things uh, are happening uh, at the same time so we are pushing the data uh, using this Jupyter notebook through uh, using python sdk using the uh, put record uh, method and that data is getting inside uh, kinesis uh, uh, firehouse and within this kinesis firehouse uh, we are transforming the source data uh, uh, using a lambda function using comprehend and then that data is ultimately getting stored in AWS Glue uh, Suman, right? So now finally, uh, let's go to uh, AWS Glue Suman and uh, let's see if we have uh, the data or not. So if you come here, if you come to 18 and you will see that uh, you have this process data, right? and it just got created now right so this data uh, contains uh, the sentiment so to check that we can again create a, a firehouse uh, 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 sorry you can again create a glue crawler and athena so let's do that so let's go to glue and uh, let's create a crawler Uh, let's uh, uh, give some name let's say product review we need to define the data source so let's select the data source and it should be product uh, review kinesis We don't want to add any other store. We need to give some permission. Let's skip that. And we will run it on demand. And we need to give some database name. So let's say my DB. And let's give some, uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, let's give some prefix. Let's say uh, customer, okay, underscore, and click on next, click on finish. And once this is done, we can click on this uh, product review and we can run the crawl. Okay, so now what is happening? What is going to happen is uh, you know this crawler is going to uh, get into uh, uh, this S3 bucket and it will try to uh, figure out if the whatever data it has and uh, you know how, how many numbers of tables that it should create and so on, right? So, and once it discovers that we can use Athena to query. So let's uh, wait for a minute. In the meantime, we can come to database, see my DB, the database and it's not yet created. So let's wait for some time. So you see that it has already created, uh, you know, discovered uh, one table. Uh, if you get inside, uh, you will see uh, the table name. Uh, let's go back. Still running. It is in stop stage. So now, if you come to tables, uh, you should be able to see customer product review, and here is this table, right? And uh, this table should have sentiment as a column. So here it is. So, so this is the column which got added uh, due to that lambda function which was triggered by uh, Kinesis uh, Firehouse, right? So uh, now uh, we are good with this. Uh, the last thing that we need to do is we need to go to Athena and query that. So let's refresh and we should be able to see the uh, customer product review partitioned and we can click on preview uh, and uh, we can preview this uh, table 
and now we can uh, run some uh, uh, query with respect to the sentiment so let's say you can do where uh, shows all the reviews where the star rating is greater than let's say three and sentiment is equal to positive let's try this okay i guess okay i have to give the typo here so here you see all the star rating which are more than uh, three and uh, uh, their sentiments are positive now if you make it as greater than four then you will see only review five uh, items right for all the uh, all the rows which contains uh, the star rating uh, of five so you see that that four is no longer here right so uh, that's about it uh, i hope that uh, you know you got a fair bit of understanding of how uh, now you know you can use uh, all these different services uh, in your application to make uh, uh, you some business intelligent decisions right so just to uh, uh, revise what we have done in the last demo because it was a little involved uh, we had uh, we had used kinesis data firehouse uh, as the uh, first line of service where we were putting uh, you know injection uh, injecting the data um, uh, using uh, using SDK right and uh, once the data uh, was there uh, we are triggering a lambda function and that lambda function was uh, you know was calling this comprehend function uh, to detect the sentiment of that uh, customer review and it was updating the data uh, uh, in uh, you know in the raw format right and that data uh, was sent uh, by the lambda function to data firehouse and data firehouse was saving that updated data right and that data contained the sentiment right whereas the input data which uh, the SDK was sending was containing only the data without uh, uh, without uh, this uh, sentiment tag right and once uh, we have this data we uh, created a crawler uh, using AWS Glue and finally we were able to query the data using this uh, you know a new field uh, called sentiment and from here we can even connect uh, uh, you know you can take some business decisions like uh, let's say uh, you know we would know uh, by this query right by this query we would know that who are the customers who are not happy with their product we can uh, send some discount coupons or we can uh, you know, reach out to them to uh, make sure that they are happy in future and uh, there is uh, you know nothing stopping us uh, to make a you know a customer obsessed uh, company right so this is the whole pipeline of uh, you know uh, uh, data analysis or data engineering uh, you can say uh, and how people uh, you know teams or people or companies can make use of all these services uh, together uh, so in the next uh, demo uh, we are going to uh, see one more practical uh, example of uh, you know all these services um, like data uh, kinesis data firehouse uh, then uh, kinesis uh, data stream and a uh, few other services and we will try to see how you can use in game development so the next uh, video is mostly uh, the demo uh, but uh, we, we will see that uh, uh, you know the practical aspects uh, i'm not going to go over all these uh, pieces like what is uh, data firehouse or what is kinesis and all of that because we have already uh, learned a bit about that uh, but we will just focus on another practical example just like this one uh, so that you get a better grasp of you know of this particular topic right so uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, joining in feel free to uh, you know uh, connect with me over linkedin and ask uh, questions uh, around this and also you know if you're getting started or if you are already practicing aws feel free to share your feedback for any of the services that you are uh, uh, you know working with and uh, we'll be very much happy to help you so uh, with that, uh, uh, I'll talk to you in the next uh, uh, session. Thank you.